quickly introduce myself. My name is Laura Saracho. I'm the content marketing manager here at Bonusly. And then today we have Brendan McEachern, the CEO and co-founder of HyperContext, and Vicky Yang, the VP of People Operations at Bonusly. And without further ado, I will pass this over to Vicky. All right, so we will jump straight in. Um, and you know, when we think about feedback, I think a lot of people automatically think annual review, right? Like that's kind of the most formal piece of feedback you can get. Um, happens maybe once a year, maybe twice a year. And overall, as you can see kind of from Gallup and Sherm and WorkHuman, people aren't all that satisfied when it comes to the annual review. Um, nobody wants to hear that you've been doing something not great six months ago. And you're like, why didn't you tell me that? Right, and you're telling me this now, and then now I have to try and fix it. And here I was trying to like um, maybe learn a new skill or thinking I might get promoted or whatever it might be, right? And so, you know, I'm not saying the annual review isn't important, but um, it's not enough. And so how do we kind of create this culture of giving and receiving feedback and creating a culture of feedback? Uh, and so we're gonna go back to basics. What is a feedback friendly culture? I think most people probably know this, right? Like we know, it's not like we don't know feedback is good. We know it needs to be specific. We know it needs to be timely. It needs to be frequent. We're not doing this once a year. Um, it's great if it's values-based, right? What was kind of the impact of the feedback, whether positive or, or critical or negative. Um, and really it should involve everyone. I think our review systems are still very predominantly um, top down in a lot of ways. But your manager doesn't always know what you're doing, right? So who else is there to give you feedback? You need peer feedback. You need feedback from your colleagues. If you're a people manager, definitely feedback from your employees as well. So all of that's really important. So when you think about, you know, what is good or bad feedback, right? Like, I think it's pretty clear which one of these is, is not great feedback. It's still feedback, right? So stop being late to meetings. Okay, that's nice. I should probably stop doing that. But what would be more impactful is if we can get specific about it. So, you know, if it would, it would help increase efficiency um, and the impact of the meeting if you would be there on time. Uh, maybe it's, we need to make sure we get through everything and we only have 30 minutes. And so we wanna make sure that that happens, right? How, understanding the impact, getting more specific, doing it right away is just gonna help people kind of understand feedback better. So I think what makes it hard, oh, I think we skipped the slide. There we, uh, there we go. What makes it really hard sometimes is we think about feedback, we tie it a lot to emotions. Uh, there's a lot of, like a lot of you mentioned, you know, confrontations, carefrontations. We're worried about kind of what the reaction is gonna be, especially when it's critical. But if we really just st step back and look at it, it's just data. Right, data, um, it's, it's a piece of information that we can use to help us make better decisions. It helps us drive efficiency, promotes learning, builds relationships and trust. And, and most importantly, it demonstrates respect. Uh, Bonusly as a company really believes in radical candor and we refer to feedback as guidance, right? It can be praise or criticism. Um, you know, praise is what we want people to do more of. Criticism helps us kind of understand and know what to do better. And so then it creates better results that everybody can see. So we want, you know, at the end of the day, it really is feedback and we need to be doing it. So when we think about giving feedback, there's also the opposite side that we don't always talk about. And that's actually one, creating space for it and also receiving feedback. And it's just as important, um, I think, when you are giving feedback is how you receive it. Uh, and feedback, I think, is never 100% correct. It's never 100% incorrect either. It's not wrong. It's, you know, I think there takes, you need to have some reflection around it. Um, so say thank you, ask for clarification where needed, and then follow up and take action on it if necessary. Um, one thing I really like to do with my team um, that maybe I don't do enough of, but I'll often say, hey, on a scale of one to 10, this feedback is a 10. It's really important. You have to do this. So there is action necessary. Or I might say, hey, this feedback is a three. It's a suggestion. Feel free to take it or leave it. Not that important. And it kind of helps people to engage, you know, where to be in that. And then one thing we can do is make sure we create enough space for it too. 
Um, so kind of, you know, when you think about asking it for it in meetings, um, in surveys, uh, you know, doing it right there and then, because I think someone mentioned this, it's easier when you ask for the feedback or if it's being asked for. So make space for that. The slides don't really want to work with us today. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. Um, so going back to kind of like, all right, we know giving feedback is important. We know receiving feedback is important. Um, I don't know if we talk a lot about like why it's so hard to do it, right? We all know it's important. Um, and I love the, the neuroscience behind the why. Uh, so if, if some of you know, uh, Dr. David Rock worked with the Neuroleadership Institute and they did all these studies to try and quote unquote, fix feedback at large companies. And I think we need to understand the why, we need to share why this happens to help create that feedback culture. And so what he found was, uh, you know, there's, there's the lizard response to our brain when we're, when we're feeling threatened, right? And that response is huge. It is way bigger than a reward response. So when, you know, in, in the past, it might be you're out in the woods and something's rustling and you're like, all right, alerts going off, giant threat response, probably should run away in case it's something that's going to eat me. Nowadays, not as big of a thing, but that feedback, like that becomes it. I mean, how many of you, when someone's like, hey, can I give you some feedback? Even, even I'm in HR, I train on this. My body already is having a physical response to verbally saying those words, right? You start to get nervous, hands might get a little bit sweaty, You're like, oh my God, what are they going to tell me? What is this going to be about? Um, all completely normal. And I think understanding that can help us really think about um, what is coming next and helping us deal with that and, and receiving that feedback. And so this is where that trust and psychological safety is really important in trying to build a culture of feedback across the company. And one of the ways to do this at scale is to really start with you know, building that habit especially through managers, um, creating that culture, making sure we're really thinking about kind of what feedback means and, and creating that trust to be able to give and receive feedback on both sides. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Brennan and he'll talk a little bit more about managers and feedback. Thanks, Vicki. I love how you entered it um, with culture, uh, saying culture is, um, culture is what happens when no one's looking. Um, and uh, if you can, create a culture where when people are looking, we're sharing feedback properly. Um, I think that's a big step one. Uh, and a big step two is, you know, what happens when uh, all the leaders at the company take a vacation and we still have low ego um, uh, culture where feedback flows freely. Um, and I think that starts at the manager. I think the manager um, in many cases is responsible for a lot of what happens when leadership uh, isn't looking. Um, and uh, uh, one of the, the big stats I think we, we often overlook um, uh, in our space anyways, is, is that in many cases, the, the largest determinant of an employee's actual engagement score comes down to their direct manager. If they have an amazing boss, um, then they're going to be pretty excited to go to work every day. And if they have a terrible boss, they're going to, what's the trend now, Sunday scaries or something? Um, they're going to be pretty scared to go to work on Monday. Um, we've all probably felt that a little bit um, in, in our own lives or experienced that in some way. Um, and so as much as things like feedback um, and things like engagement are a company-wide um, priority, I think they're also a team-wide priority because it's been proven you can switch teams um, and uh, go from being disengaged to engaged. I think managers are really something to think about as you think about the culture um, of feedback uh, at your company. When we talk about feedback, um, uh, typically I think it's, it's talk top down, really want to change that to be bottoms up, um, thinking about that on the team level, um, as well as, uh, diagonally, horizontally, all directions. Um, so that we really create this high engagement workplace. Um, and, um, as, as leaders it, it's, or as managers, obviously people attending, um, uh, the webinar, um, it's not just giving feedback. Um, I think that's stressful. It's in receiving feedback as well. And um, one thing to think about, um, it, it's really how we improve. It's really how we grow. That's our, um, our tool as leaders to become better leaders. Um, 
in some cases, you might be getting feedback that you're micromanaging. In some cases, you might be getting feedback that you're too hands off. But the calibration muscle of how you become a better leader really happens through um, feedback. And without that, um, I think you're just suppressing some of the needs, frustrations, and challenges um, of your team. So I think I'm going to advocate. I think other people would advocate more feedback to, um, tends to be a better thing. And I think we often rely um, too heavily on formal feedback. Um, uh, where there's a set cadence that the feedback lands and it's time to share feedback. It's performance review season, you know, it's a season all of a sudden um, uh, that we have to go to go through. And I think the idea of building a culture of feedback is to remove that idea that you need this formal moment um, to share feedback. Um, the space for it that I think he was talking about is really important. Those formal moments create these really um, amazing spaces. Um, to share feedback, but you can create your own um, as often as you, as you want, as often as you can. Um, and so what are those additional avenues? Um, and a lot of companies, um, I think a lot of leaders rely on this long-term feedback um, touch points um, that are listed here. And I think it makes us lazy, right? And, and we tend to just wait for those moments instead of looking for opportunities to create more. Um, if you think of splitting the, the concept of feedback up into like the, the two, the two um, uh, emotions, right? The threat and reward, right? Praise, criticism. Um, there are obvious places where I think we can do a really good job of, of praise and obvious places where you wanna um, maybe do um, critical feedback in private versus um, maybe um, positive feedback on a team meeting or a public channel on Slack or something like that. It's a lot easier said than done. Um, so we have a couple ways, a couple things to take you through. Um, uh, to, to add to some of those moments and, and share. I think the big one for us um, is going to be as leaders looking at your calendar. What are the moments that exist in your calendar where you can foster a culture of feedback, right? I think some have said it in the chat already. You probably have a mix of one-on-ones with your team members throughout the week. What are the opportunities? What are the moments that you can generate in, those, um, in that space for feedback? And think of it both ways, up and down. Um, how can you enable an easier uh, space for them to share feedback with you and, and for you to share feedback with them? Team meetings, um, all hands meetings, you know, what are the moments there for reward and recognition? Um, I, think, I think meetings is, the, is, is um, the easiest place for it because it's, it's already documented, it's pre-existing, it's already there. So if you kind of switch tabs to your calendar now, click on one or two of those meetings and say, you know, what are we gonna do? Um, differently next week uh, or tomorrow um, to increase the rate at which feedback flows um, in that one moment in time. And for us, we think a lot about the one-on-one -on -one meeting. I think it's a, a really high leverage moment in your calendar as a manager to share feedback uh, with your direct report, but also to receive feedback with your direct report. Um, often, I think people will say it's the manager's best tool for engaging and retaining your team as well. Um, but I think the way you do those things is by calibrating yourself as a manager. And I think you um, uh, can do that uh, through feedback. Um, it's also a really great opportunity uh, for the employee to have dedicated time and a moment to share feedback you know, with you, um, whether that's about you or about other things they're seeing uh, uh, with the team. So if you're not creating that moment, you're probably missing out um, on a lot of things. It's, it's often hard for an employee, no matter how senior or junior, to kind of um, uh, come out of nowhere, especially as a remote company, interrupt you and say, hey, I want to give you, you know, this weird, challenging feedback. So creating those moments, creating those opportunities are, are really, really important. Um, and they're amazing moments um, for the employees to grow and manage up. I think there is an, uh, an article on Bonus Day about managing up that was shared uh, in the chat. Um, a huge opportunity to consistently have this dedicated time um, with their manager for undivided attention, not only for feedback, but to talk about career path growth opportunities, um, to talk about things that maybe they're missing or, or learnings that they need to have. Um, and for you as a manager to run coaching sessions. So I think the, the feedback that Vicky shared about showing up late for meetings, um, it might also be not just that you've given that feedback, but it might be a moment to say, well, what's making you late for meetings consistently, right? And how do we actually resolve the thing, you know, the 15 minutes prior so that um, uh, you don't have to, uh, you know, show up late? Maybe it's, it's actually less about showing up late for meetings and more about 
how do you cut people off and say bye on time from your previous meeting if you're running back to back? Um, and those coaching sessions, I think, are really helpful moments. Um, they're often missed, uh, especially in, in remote cultures, unless they're taken seriously. Um, and for the employees, I think that helps them bring up frustrations and blockers that prevent them from being a high-performing team. So really great opportunity to share feedback with your manager, but I also think about them as, um, you know, where are the moments in your company to do a skip level meeting or a peer meeting or, um, uh, or two peers to go um, uh, back to back to share, share meetings without going through you. So one thing I wanted to cover really quickly is in those moments, what do you have to do to create um, a, a amazing uh, uh, culture in that little micro meeting, in that um, recurring calendar event on your calendar um, that enables feedback to flow freely. There's three um, keys, I would say, to, to ensuring that you're gonna get this uh, to happen with your team. The first is safety. The second is effort. The third is benefit. So I'll cover these really, really quickly, but I think we've written uh, on this topic quite a bit. First being safety. Um, what we're talking about here is psychological safety. We've, we've talked about it a little bit um, earlier uh, in the webinar. Um, what we mean by psychological safety is, um, you know, that threat response. How safe does this environment feel um, that you don't feel like running away from it. You don't feel like, um, you know, avoiding conflict. You don't feel like being the, the one person with a different opinion. The analogy I often use is um, uh, psychological safety um, in kindergarten is typically really, really high. And in high school is typically really, really low. Um, kindergartners don't care what clothes they're wearing. They don't care if they are playing with rocks or grass or bugs. Uh, they just want to play together. And if, you know, you, a uh, kindergartner grows up from to, to uh, one of their friends and said, hey, do you want to play with rocks? That other person can say, no, I don't really like rocks. Do you want to play with bugs? Um, and no one gets their feelings hurt. Whereas in high school, without even words being said, just glances, everyone starts wearing the same jeans um, or jeggings, as we were talking about maybe a little earlier. Um, and uh, that's low psychological safety, right? Everyone wants to conform to the clicks, to the group think, right? And no one wants to say, well, maybe there's better ways of doing things. Um, they don't want to step on toes um, and they want to make sure that, that they're not the outcast, right? As tribal creatures, um, in many cases, a huge threat is being the outcast in your tribe. And so high degree of psychological safety um, in teams and cultures um, typically allows for people to be themselves. Um, and in fact, in um, Google's case, their people analytics uh, looked through all of their data across all of their teams and found the single highest um, factor for a high performing team was a team with high psychological safety. So that's always the starting point. I'll give you maybe tips on how to accomplish that um, in a second. The second is effort. So if you think about effort um, is, you know, sometimes what gives you anxiety about giving people feedback is they might start being defensive right? Um, they might start challenging you to give um, hyper-specific examples. Sometimes I think about it as like, you know, if you've ever worked up the courage to give feedback to someone who's high effort, it might feel like you've, you've had to um, drink a couple cups of coffee, maybe write out your thoughts in advance, back it up. It feels like you're defending a PhD dissertation, right? You're going in there ready for a battle. Um, hopefully your point makes it across. I think what you want to create on your team is a low effort culture, right? Low effort, often sometimes people talk about it as low ego, um, where people are willing to listen. Um, there's a couple of tips and, and ways to do that. Um, but effort being really, really low is crucial because what happens is if it's high, people will um, get too tuckered out. They'll be too tired at the end of the day to say that one little thing um, and they'll just not bother, right? Um, and if you can make it through those two points, I think one of the hardest points sometimes for uh, managers, especially radical candor folks, if you're a ruinous empathy person, you probably also struggle a little bit with benefit, which is when someone shares feedback with you um, and you say you're gonna do something about it, do you actually? Um, do you actually do something about it? And oftentimes I think the ruinous empathy people are, are nodding along in agreement and accidentally committing to doing something with this feedback, even if maybe it not their heart of hearts, they disagree. Um, and if you don't do anything with that feedback, if you just listen to it, like a therapist would, um, maybe don't act on it, eventually people will stop sharing with you, right? You've probably heard, um, uh, you know, peers at some point in previous companies say, 
what's the point of sharing? What's the point of telling management? They don't even listen, right? Um, and uh, I think that's something to watch for, especially if you have good intentions with benefit. So a couple quick tips uh, on this, maybe before we, we go into my other tips. Um, on safety, go back one slide, sorry, Hibba. On safety, how do you create uh, a really uh, culture or a, a team culture that's really high safety? Be vulnerable first, right? Um, be the person who is willing to ask the stupid question or um, uh, challenge your own thoughts, right? Um, be the person who is willing to go a little bit deeper emotionally. Go be the person, you know, lead, right? Um, lead with psychological safety. I think um, people will follow that once they know it, that it's safe. If it doesn't feel safe for you to do it as a manager, how on earth would it feel safe um, for your team to do that, especially when you can fire them, right? Um, you want to make sure that, that we're, you're, 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 um, you're being more vulnerable than they are. Um, on effort, um, how you can control this. Uh, the first step is when people are sharing feedback with you, um, the best way to listen is actually to repeat what they're saying back to them. Think about it as reflecting, like your face is a mirror. None of that feedback is hitting you. You're just reflecting it back. If they say something like, Brennan, you're you know, showing up late to meetings, you say, okay, what I'm hearing is I'm showing up late to meetings. Guaranteed, they will say yes, and. They'll go, yeah, and, and you'll get a little bit more to the heart. Um, and you'll help them give that feedback. That's a low effort um, uh, way to do that. High benefit, the only tip I'll give you on high benefit, is it gonna depend on the feedback itself, is to not commit to anything um, except for thinking about the feedback and coming back to them, right? So you imagine if this is a one-on-one -on -one and someone's given you really critical feedback, just say, listen, thank you for the feedback. Here's what I'm gonna to commit to. I'm gonna think about this. I'm gonna ask a couple of my peers, um, and other people. And next week in our next one-on-one, -on -one, I'm going to come back to you with my thoughts. That's the only thing you have to commit to. But that alone makes the person feel heard, listened to. Um, and when you come back with your actual thoughts, um, uh, hopefully there is real benefit to, to sharing that. Okay. So that's some theory I've got to throw in tips. Um, but a couple other actionable um, things for um, asking and giving uh, feedback. Uh, the right way. One is be specific. We've talked about that a little bit. Where can I improve is, <laughs> we said not specific, pretty terrific. Okay. Um, where can I improve versus where can I improve with my management skills? Even more specific, the better. Um, this is actually talked about a lot when you um, are a parent with young kids. How is school good, right? Um, how is math class when the exam, uh, you know, the pop quiz happened and what did you do with algebra is a little bit better, right? You'll get more responses that way. So how, where can I improve with my management skills? That's better. Um, super terrific is, hey, in the last kickoff presentation when I was communicating our strategy, right? Um, as it relates to the new employees on our team, do you think there's anything I can do to increase the clarity of how I communicated the strategy, right? You'll get way more, um, uh, better feedback. Second thing is document it. We forget everything. You um, retain only about 10% of what you learn in a meeting after seven days. So write it down, it will help you a lot um, and show that you take that feedback seriously. Like I mentioned, um, demonstrate that you're making those changes, especially company-wide if you're trying to create that culture. Um, finally, important to continue to review the conversations you're having with each direct report. We tend to, as human beings, have blind spots to um, uh, each individual. So some individuals, it's really easy to have conversations um, maybe about their motivation. And some people, it's really easy to have conversations about their work performance, right? Um, it turns out we as managers have different blind spots for different people. So um, very, um, very important to make sure you're, you're double checking your own biases as you're going to these rooms and making sure you're covering all your, your um, uh, uh, bases there. Um, try things like question roulette, maybe that's a bad word, but where you, um, you know, ask a random question in a, um, a variety of categories at, at uh, every meeting, um, just to give yourself a little bit um, of air cover on, on your own biases. So you're, you're asking a random question, you can blame the randomness of the question um, on uh, Brennan, right? Like Brennan told me to ask this question roulette thing. I have no idea where this conversation is going to lead. And you'd be surprised at how um, awesome some of those conversations are. Um, and then ultimately, I think share the responsibility of feedback sharing with your team, right? So team meetings, I think are a really awesome place for um, team recognition. It doesn't always have to come through your mouth. 
Um, you can add, add things to the uh, agenda um, uh, to get shout outs from your team, to prompt some of these thoughts from your team um, ahead of time. Vicky's going to go into more uh, about the recognition piece in more depth in a second. So I won't cover that. But one thing that we do um, is kind of a twist a little bit on the concept of employee of the month um, at HyperContact. So instead of doing an employee of the month, which is, you know, the management goes and says, here's an employee who does a great job. Um, instead, um, we uh, have this thing called the Narwhal Award, which is uh, the, you know, Canadian unicorn or whatever. Um, but we have this thing called the Narwhal Award, which is peer driven. Um, and uh, every month, the current narwhal gives the narwhal off uh, to the next narwhal um, and creates some rules that they have to follow as the narwhal and, and, and change those rules. And I think one thing that's really special about this award is when people receive it, they're um, genuinely shocked and feel appreciated and recognized in front of the whole company. Um, in a way, I think that's so much more meaningful than if management did it because it's almost like management has to, um, whereas they don't need to be recognized by their peers. It feels a little bit more special. So creating those moments, creating those um, little bits of culture that help um, your team share feedback, whether it's positive or negative, um, I think is really important to creating that culture of feedback on your team. Okay, I'll pass it back to Vicky at this point uh, to cover a couple more things. You're on mute, Vicky, but it was great. Whatever you said was great. It was it was the golden nugget, and I can't repeat it again. So sorry, everybody. Uh, thanks, Brennan. Um, so some of this might look familiar from the beginning, right? Like when we talk about uh, sorry, when we talk about feedback, we want it to be specific, timely, frequent, values based, and kind of involving everyone. Uh, and we talked about psychological safety and creating that space. Um, trying to reduce threats. And I think we don't take into account sometimes how much recognition, which is positive feedback, actually feeds into this. Um, and to Brennan's kind of last point, like having it come from everybody and all around and not just top down, top down definitely matters, um, creates that space to be able to give and receive more feedback. Um, you know, I've been in HR for 15 to 20 years now. And I'll be honest, when I first came to Bonusly and we and I saw this product actually in action, I was like, wow, this actually, this works really well. I've known this whole time, recognition is important, positive feedback is important. And we talk about numbers, right? Studies show that you maybe if you, you know, if you give like 10 pieces of it, then you can give that critical feedback. And it's in, in Bonusly, we, we live that. And so being able to see that kind of in action has made me really double down more on really how do we create that opportunity for more recognition so that you can create that culture feedback, create that safety and that trust to be able to give that strong feedback when you have to. Um, and what are, and some of the reasons in the next slide that I'll go into on like kind of why we think this is important is, and it's not just creating that culture of feedback, like feedback a culture of feedback also leads and bleeds into a lot of other things. They're so interconnected. So what we're really looking at is also reinforcing values, um, you know, creating that trust, strengthening purpose. So everyone's kind of walking in that same direction towards whatever goal we're trying to do, increasing connection so that we can create those spaces for feedback, um, developing kind of resilience uh, to be able to give and talk about what's, you know, what's hard and what's going well, what's not going well. Um, and then just making sure we, we're looking at, you know, if everyone's kind of, one, if the company's successful and we're giving feedback and we're doing better, then of course that's going to kind of improve engagement and productivity. So all in all, um, I am a strong believer, granted, <laughs> of course I work for Bonusly, but I am a strong believer that even if you don't use Bonusly, making sure you create a place where you can give a lot of positive feedback will help you create that culture company wide of being able to have a feedback culture that's both about positive and critical feedback. All right, let's see. Um, Monica Landy asked the question, what are your thoughts on performance ratings? Does assigning a performance rating to someone help or hurt the effort to convey feedback and help them grow? Oh, this was my bread and butter. I spent a lot of years in performance management. Um, I have very mixed feelings about it. Uh, I think there was even a study done with um, 
uh, Olympic medalists where silver medalists actually did not feel as good as gold medalists bronze. or even bronze medalists. Bronze, yeah, yeah, bronze medalists kind of were like, all right, I made it. Um, and someone's like, why didn't I make gold? And so it, it really depends and varies by person. Um, and what I, I think the better thing to anchor on, which I, a lot of the time the ratings are actually really for kind of behind the scenes work of figuring out compensation, right? We have comp budgets, we can't do anything about it. And that's one of the, the ways to kind of figure out a, a stack ranking of sorts to be able to see who are we gonna give money to and how much. Um, if we're really talking about performance, I think what we're trying to get at is does, is what the person doing aligning with our expectations for what they should be doing in the role and how, and where is it, where is it missing? Where is it going really well? And so ratings for me, I, I'm not a fan of it. I don't think it's necessary. Like let's really talk about what the work is and make sure we're clear on kind of what the job is and talk about those pieces and then separate comp and some of that like rating stuff away from that. But that's my own personal opinion on it. I think like my personal opinion on it is, um, if the employee wants that feeling, right, then, um, and, and will perform best under it, like, sure, right, um, adjust your style a little bit. I think for me personally, um, I think you want to know as a, as a leader in the back of your head, like, um, you know, categorize your team in one of three ways, like, should, is this, should this person be on our team? Um, and then, you know, yes, no, and, and if they should be on your team, if they quit, um, how hard are you going to fight? Are you going to fight your, you know, butt off um, to keep them um, and have them change their mind? Or are you going to let them go and kind of cheer them on? Um, and if they're uh, let them go and cheer them on, I think, I think you have to work to get them into the other category. I think you should have a, a, a full team around you that you're just absolutely willing to fight for. Um, and um, I, I think that's, to me, more where I don't know if you, uh, it's probably a, a secret list that you have in the back of your head, but um, I think that's more how I think about the performance ratings of, um, you know, every, every day, every week, like, you know, what are we doing to make sure that this person who I'm talking to and working with is, um, you know, is a member of the team that we're willing to fight for. Um, I don't know if, if a, a zero to 10 scale is going to do that for every individual on our team, probably not. Um, and it might end up creating more harm long-term. Awesome. Great question, Monica. Thank you. Kenneth, you asked two questions. I'm going to combine them into one. So you asked if more frequent um, feedback can appear to be micromanaging, and then also if you have recommendations for methods to provide frequent feedback. Um, I think it depends on the person and kind of what's being said. So if it's positive, I don't think you can really over index on that too much, um, unless the person's a poor performer and you're only giving positive and that's going to be an issue. Um, but yeah, if it's, you know, some people can take a lot of some people are like, no, you just got to tell me every single thing all at once or else I'm going to sit here and wonder if, if things are not going well. Um, and then that's a question I love asking myself is, do I need to give this feedback? Like, is it to make myself feel better because I didn't like something um, or is this actually going to help the person? And so that sometimes can filter out, you know, whether you're going to give it or not, um, you know, spreading it out is also helpful. Um, and then I think to the second part of like, you know, what can you use? Again, going back to like how people like their feedback. Some people actually don't like public recognition. Um, and so knowing that's really important too. So are you you know, maybe just emailing them or, or, you know, sending texts or, you know, what, it, it doesn't hurt to ask, like, how do you like your feedback? Um, you know, do you need time to prepare? Do you want me to write it down and send it to you first so you can think about it and then we can talk about it later? Like, figuring that out is really important. And I think that's one of the challenges and why our tools all exist, you know, why hyper context ex exists, why bonusly exists is because everyone's so different. So we're still Kind of figure out what works for different people. Yeah, I think you want to make sure, like one of the, as you increase the volume of feedback that you're you're um, putting in the right spot. So if it's a really nitpicky piece of feedback, like don't wait three weeks to give that nitpicky piece of feedback, right? Like get that out in the moment. I think if it's 
relating to work, it's a little bit easier to do that um, uh, asynchronously or whatever. But um, I think you want to make sure that if it's uh, if it's feedback that's worth sharing, I think you're going to want to, the thing I always say is like, <clears throat> um, don't let it pass the weekend, right? Um, I think for a lot of us, like the weekend is kind of this like great cleansing of stress and you come back Monday. Um, and if uh, what you did on, you know, Wednesday of last week is going to, um, uh, you know, that baggage is going to carry forward and your manager is going to hold, hold you to it and always be on you about something. I think you just want to make sure that the frequency, the duration of these things just kind of match the, um, the importance of it. And then the, the big thing is just making sure that everyone knows this is part of psychological safety, I think, um, is that this feedback is coming from a place of like cr taking this individual from being an A player on the team to being like an absolute, you know, A triple plus, um, like, hey, I, I don't want to do this. Giving critical feedback is exhausting for me, but I want to do this because I believe you can be um, you know, and just an absolute incredible person in your career and, per, per, you know, profession. So I'm doing this to invest in you less than doing this to just be a, like an evil person. That's a great point <laughs> and a great thing to, to kick off, like tee up the feedback with of like that context of this is why I'm delivering this to you. Um, awesome. All right, Christine, your question. I know this also came up a bunch in the chat. Do you have suggestions for creating trust among remote slash hybrid employees? Brandon, you want to go first? I feel like pra I can go first. Pra practice. I like the back and forth. Practice it. I mean, you're not gonna. It's not. It's not gonna be a thing that just like magically happens um, um, in, in one go. I think the big thing is practice it. I think um, commit to it as a team. Uh, you know, you build, build trust, like the saying that we have in our handbook is you build trust, like you build bridges. Right. Um, and you're going to start, um, uh, you're going to start with something that maybe is like sh a shaky bridge that not everyone's going to want to walk across, but, um, as they use it more and as they learn, um, that the more they step on it, the, 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 you know, it actually is pretty good at, at holding the team together. Um, then, you know, the more willing we are to actually forget that we're on a bridge, um, and just cross those chasms a lot. So I think the big thing is practice it, start small, do it a lot. Um, what we like to do, um, uh, or what we like to talk about is like, even just make a pact on it, right? Like, um, you know, we talk about the lettuce pact a lot, but, um, even just like make a pact and say like, Hey, I'm going to commit to, um, you know, trusting that when you give feedback, you're doing it with good intent, right? And like, when you give feedback to me, you're doing it with good intent. Like, do we agree on that? Yeah, cool, awesome. Let's like virtually shake hands. I think the big thing is is um, is, is practice. It's not something that as humans, um, everyone starts, um, you know, trusting everyone completely. Um, so um, practice and prove it. Yeah, and the, the lettuce pack thing, I think is super important. We, at Bonusly, we do working agreements because if you are remote and you are hybrid, what often comes up is, is the people who you, you kind of see, right? There's, low, there's kind of um, recency and then and uh, distance bias. Um, and so how you, where are those areas that as a team you're gonna agree on like, okay, we know, let's say if, if after a meeting we have an off camera conversation, we're all gonna put that back <clears> in the back <throat> so everybody has that information. Um, so just making sure you're having that open conversations and agreeing to, okay, this is how we're going to work because we know having people in kind of different places is hard. I think also like the final point on this, this is one that's like, there's probably a hot button pretty close to whatever this question is for me, but you know, like, um, I think people watch how everyone interacts with everyone else and, and starts to create uh, somewhat of an assumption of of how they'll be treated in those scenarios. So um, in order for people to trust you, you also, um, you, you earn that with every interaction you have with team members, right? So if you're gossiping about other people, they're gonna assume you're gossiping about them, right? Um, or if other, everyone else is gossiping and you're not, they're just gonna assume you are gossiping, right? So I think there's, um, I think there's a lot of, um, you know, sussing out um, the culture a little bit that happens. Um, and I think you have to be very, very intentional about um, all of your interactions, uh, especially when it's easier for you to not um, 
uh, go above and beyond for your team. And I think like the good example here is when someone on your team leaves, right? Um, when they leave, do you kind of badmouth them um, after they're gone? Uh, when they leave, do you help them get their next job? Do you help them get more money at their next job? Like if you're consistently helping your team get their next job and get way more money at their next job, then all of a sudden, you know, the rest of your team, they hear about that. They have private chat groups that you're not invited to, right? Like they hear about that stuff. And, and um, if it's consistently true, people are going to trust you. Great point. Awesome. All right. We have a question from Adam. He asks, what are some best practices for what to do with the mutual feedback from a tracking and accountability standpoint? So he lists goal setting, improvement plan, reserve time and agenda to discuss progress. So yeah, best practices for how to track that feedback. If it's something I think that, that needs to be worked on, then definitely in some sort of documented, whether, you know, whatever works for people, whether that's a one-on-one -on -one doc, or maybe you have some sort of system that you can use, turning it into a goal is definitely good. Like even if it's a personal development goal um, and, and just making sure that you're tracking towards outcome. If it's something small, I don't know if it needs to be tracked um, or, or put somewhere, but really it's, yeah, if, if it's something you're working on, then definitely. I don't know if best practice, write it down, <laughs> write it down and check it. So whatever you're going to, whatever system you're going to use, if you can write it down and check it, that'll be it. Yeah, largely the same. I think you just want to make sure that it, it can flow, right? Like um, it's, it's not, you know, it might not be every week or every month that someone on your team has like feedback for you or that you have feedback for, for your team. I think you just want to make sure that when there is feedback, um, you know, is it flowing? And if you find a scenario where like you should have heard about something or someone should have known something or someone should have shared something and they, they're they not going directly to that person, um, you know, that might be a sign that hey, it's not flowing. What's going on here? How do we uncover it? Yeah, and it's just good to track feedback and like look at your feedback over time in your career, right? In your role and see from, from day one to when you move on, like how you've grown and the feedback you've gotten, how that's changed. So, all right, we have about 10 more minutes. We do have a handful of questions. So an interesting question from someone who is anonymous asked, what if your organization has a culture of sweeping things under the rug? Any suggestions on introducing a baseline of encouraging the sharing of construction, constructive feedback? I got to go to Vicky on that one because for me, it's tough as a CEO. I would, oh, that's horrible. If I found that. my, yeah. the way I would figure that out would be different than Vicky. So I'll pass that to her. Um, oh, I don't think I have a good response to this one. Uh, if it's top down, it is going to be very hard to change. Um, I often, there's an analogy that, that my husband and I use, he's also an HR where it's like, okay, if your company values are this way, whether that's good or bad. And if you believe in this, there's only kind of like a couple of options, right? You either figure out a way to kind of uh, align to it somehow, which is going to be really hard if it's, especially if it's values based. Uh, try and pull the company this way, which is almost near impossible unless you're part of the leadership team um, or it's finding another company that, that lines up. So if they already have a culture of sweeping things under the rug, it is unlikely that things will change unless the top wants to change. Um, and you know, you can it might it, you can try testing the waters and seeing if your manager is seeing how many people feel this way, maybe talking to your HR person and seeing if there's a way to do some sort of anonymous survey so that feels a little bit more safe um, to to get that data and then seeing if they actually care and will do anything about that data, right? I think a big part of feedback, especially as a manager or as part of the leadership team is if, if you don't do anything with it, then forget it. <laughs> Why are you asking for feedback? You, and you're not gonna do something with all of the feedback, but it's impossible that all the feedback you get would not be actionable on some part. Um, so yeah, I don't think there's necessarily a way to fix it. There's a way to test it and then kind of deciding if that's something you're okay with or not. I think, and I think most leaders probably don't want to be known as leaders who sweep things under a rug too. So there's like some identity that you can, strings that you can pull on a little bit there. Um, 
if I think of like, um, you know, use signals for, for one to like get that app up and running at your company. So you can use data to at least convince these, uh, these people that the, 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 the um, employee base feels this way. I think step one is like, isn't an opinion that we sweep things under the rug or is it fact? If it's fact, then, you know, it turns out that there's a lot of other facts that correlate sweeping things under the rug with being really bad right, um, for performance of the company. And so there's other strings that you can pull on to, to, figure, to figure that out, but um, yeah. no, it's tough. One thing I would add is if you are going to give feedback, what can help is you know, stating it as like, when this was stated and it looked like this happened, it came across as sweeping under the rug. So that way it's not just, it feels like you're sweeping stuff under the rug, you're telling them what actually looked like it. So that way maybe they can, they can respond to that piece. Often it comes from too, like, I know in my own career moments where things appeared as, as sweeping under the rug really were things that were like, you know, being self-conscious or not confident personally, right? It, you know, it's a key member of the team leaves, uh-oh, like, will other people leave, right? Um, so I don't really want to make a big show and tell about it. And actually that like low confidence causes more people to freak out and be like, oh, should we be worried? Why are they sweeping this under the rug? Um, and uh, um, so I, I think there's, yeah, there's a, a lot of things at play there, but, um, but I think for the most part, I would say like most leaders don't want those traits to be associated with them or their organizations. I think they, they just don't know how to operate the other way. And it's either boils down to like, and an ego issue in, in some cases, um, or, um, uh, or they don't know it's an ignorance issue, or they feel like it's an absolute waste of time and they have busy, they're busy, better things to do. And in which case, I think you, you can overcome some of those obstacles, but uh, that just might be hard. Yeah, great question and, and really insightful answers. It's definitely a tricky one. Um, in a similar vein, especially if this issue is top down, a couple of questions around upward feedback. And I know we chatted about this a little bit, but do you both have um, insight onto how to give your, your boss, your manager feedback considering issues that you have with them? Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, there's different ways to do it. It's, it and it depends on kind of how willing they are to also take that feedback. And if they're open to it, then, then great. Maybe it's just telling them straight, right? Um, the other piece is if it's hard or if it's hard for you is structuring around kind of how it might make you be able to do your job better. So, you know, if manager, you did X, um, or if you're not giving me this information or, you know, whatever it might be, then I can't do Y or it's making it hard to do Y or I need it because of why. Um, and then if it's in relation to your to the work, right? Like trying to pull the people out of it a bit and saying, here's the impact of that, that might be able to, uh, might be a little bit easier to kind of get that feedback sometimes. So I think the like big hack here is to just like hi hijack a, a little bit of like the human brain. So we'll read up on like some, some biases the human brain have, and then like just try to reverse engineer some scenarios that are helpful. So like the, the first thing you could do I would say is just come out of this webinar, go to your one-on-one -on -one with your boss and immediately add like three items on the agenda. Like what's the best way to give you um, recognition? Second item is like, what's the best way to give you nitpicky feedback on your work? What's the best way to give you really harsh feedback um, about how you, how you manage people or how you're managing me? Obviously don't do that if you have like really harsh feedback that meeting to bring up. But go and do that. You can blame Brennan. Be like, I just did this webinar. Brennan said I had to do these things. I'm going to do these things and be a good student or whatever and, um, and do it. And then document those answers, share them back to that person so that they know that, okay, shit, like I'm being going to be held accountable to this at some point in the future. And then when the time comes, follow their instructions. Like try to, try to have them write a manual for how to do that. Follow their instructions. And people tend to have um, a consistency bias where they like to be consistent with um, what they previously said. Uh, so you can kind of reverse engineer some of those things into, Hey, I know you said when it came to like really hairy feedback issues about how you manage people, you liked me just to bring it to you straight and give it to you hard. Are you ready? And then you'll find out like if they actually, um, can handle it that way. 
but I, I would say try to do some pre-work before you go into it. Yeah, just blame me. Yeah, blame Brennan. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point because everyone wants to receive it a little bit differently. So finding the best um, way to do that really helps kind of release some of that tension. Um, okay, we're almost at the top of the hour. I think we have time for one more question. So this question comes from Monica and she asks, how can you tell if the poor feedback culture you are experiencing is unique to your manager and immediate team versus a staple of the overall organizational culture you are in? Um, I'm a big fan of just asking. Like, I think it's a lot of kind of, uh, you know, we, we're like, how do I know? Or where can I understand? And not often enough do we just say, how do you want your feedback? Um, how do you take it? How do you actually work? when it comes in, in when it's in the situation um and so if you're you're feeling something then then maybe it's talking to another team and saying how are you all doing feedback or if you're a people manager you know, talking to other people managers how are you doing this on your teams and if they all come back and say oh we're not then i think that's a sign and if they are maybe then it's it, you know they're doing something different over there um and depending on how big the company is like you can create little microcosm cultures of of safety where there is a lot of feedback given back and forth and and sometimes there's going to be not be in some other places 